Well, let's take us back to a story we were earlier reporting on, uh, the story of Syria, and that the UN has said that the footprints of established terrorist groups can be seen in Syria. For more on that, I'm joined from Washington by Webster Griffin Tarpley, author and historian. Welcome to the program, sir. Uh, doctor, first of all, how surprising is it Thank to you. you to see UN Chief Ban Ki-moon expressing concern about the situation in Syria? And uh, what does uh, Ban Ki-moon's breaking of his own silence mean to the UN Security Council? Well, in the case of Ban Ki-moon, we must always suspect ulterior motives, that is, an evil intent. And in these circles that Ban Ki-moon speaks for, that is to say NATO and imperialism in general, the new line is no longer to deny the presence of al-Qaeda in Syria, but to begin to cite al-Qaeda as yet another reason why an invasion and bombing will be necessary. That is to say, if this terrible situation goes on any longer, then al-Qaeda might get the upper hand. We heard Hillary Clinton, in a rare moment of candor in the past week, also conceding the presence of al-Qaeda in Syria. However, we need to point out the reason that al-Qaeda is there is because these NATO uh, heads of government, heads of state, and, and other officials have brought al-Qaeda into the picture. Al-Qaeda is what it always was, the CIA Arab Legion. And in particular, some of the most uh, experienced Al-Qaeda operatives were brought from Tripoli in Libya all the way to uh, southern Turkey, to uh, Iskandarun and other places, in a kind of an airlift by NATO some months ago. So much so that when uh, Ambassador Jafari of Syria showed his CD, at the United Nations, he said that the Syrian government has these confessions of foreign fighters, including Turkish and Libyan foreign fighters. And I think we can assume that's Libyan Islamic fighting group, which is uh, therefore Al-Qaeda. So uh, Ban Ki-moon is just as morally bankrupt as he always was. It's just that he's had to change his, his, uh, his, his mode of attack. The entire situation of this resistance is, of course, desperate. Uh, as a result of the Syrian election a couple of weeks ago, when more than half of the possible voters voted under the worst possible conditions, uh, the Syrian National Council is breaking apart, and uh, the leader, Galyun, has now resigned. He's out. So there, there is no coherent opposition. So now they're, they're less worried about trying to pretend that there's a political opposition and more with, let's get on with the invasion. And then and just imagine if those armed gangs who claim to be the saviors of the Syrian people yet kill innocent civilians and use the human population as a human shield, according to reports, d uh, just imagine they came to power. I mean, what kind of a government would we see? Isn't it paradoxical? Well, this, this is, of course, the essence of the imperial, uh, imperialist policy. It is partition, mini-states, micro-states, failed states. It's more or less what you see in Libya. We notice that the, uh, the Western media have been much less interested in showing us the wonders of democracy, the singing tomorrows of the National Transitional Council in Libya, because that country, of course, is tragically breaking up, and you've got terrorist gangs and, uh, uh, and the, the beginnings of a, of a separation of different parts of the country. This is what they would like to bring to Syria using NATO bombing invasion, and the shock troops, the, the people that NATO has on the ground at the moment, are these uh, al-Qaeda types, supplemented, of course, by mercenaries from France, Turkey, and, and other countries. The specific em emphasis we have right now, though, is to try to cut a corridor, and it won't be a humanitarian corridor, it'll be a terror corridor, starting with Tripoli, uh, Lebanon now, northern Lebanon, and this Kliat airport, which NATO would like to seize. That's why we've had an increase in terrorist assassinations in that area. We've had the kidnapping of the pilgrims. This is a thrust to try to get a corridor from the Mediterranean into Syria through Tripoli and the Kliad airport. And so, uh, according to what you said, I mean, what lies ahead for Syria in the long term, especially in terms of uh, the Assad government? How long uh, can the Assad government uh, resist and maintain his power? I think the, the Assad government is politically better off uh, in the last two weeks than it was before because they've successfully carried out 
a national election, a multi-party election. The Constitution has been changed so that the Ba'ath Party no longer has a monopoly of power. I think anybody who is sincerely interested in democratic reforms has participated in that election. Some of them did get elected. The people who have been boycotting it have isolated themselves. They're now exposed as either Al-Qaeda or fellow travelers of Al-Qaeda. So it seems to me that the, the NATO political situation has gotten desperate, and their only way out of that is to try to uh, escalate the military side. But there, once again, they risk the collision with Russia, China, uh, and others who uh, are, are not going to allow them to do that, at least under the United Nations cover. One of the, one of the places to look for a possible resolution of this is the Bilderberger meeting here near Washington, D.C., at the end of next week would typically be a place where a solution to that dilemma uh, might emerge and therefore bears very, very careful watching. Indeed, and of course we'll keep a close eye on it as well. Uh, many thanks uh, to uh, Webster Griffin Tarpley, author and historian from Washington. Thanks for your time there, sir.